social norms, and social norm is a term that's been brought up a lot since um, the election about, you know, for example, the fact that we're discovering a lot of the ways in which presidents, presidents behaved um, and candidates behaved, um, it turns out, um, uh, was in an expectation of or following a social norm rather than an actual rule, right? And so interest in social norms has spiked, I think. Um, and so what I thought I might do in this teaching is just say a little bit about what we mean when we study social norms and give you three studies that I think and hope um, can lead you to some actionable ideas. Um, and, uh, and I want you know your input on whether you think that they're actionable maybe what else we should be doing as researchers as we study this topic. Um, so um, the material I've got is to describe these studies to you, what we are observing um, when it comes to the way social norms operate in terms of guiding our behaviors and our perceptions. Um, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm just encouraging you to, to interact as, as much as possible. Um, the first thing that I want you to do though is maybe we could um, do a little activity. A lot of you have notes, uh, notepads already out. Um, so if you don't, maybe grab a piece of paper or you can just think about this um, with yourself. Um, so the first thing to do would be to think about a community that's important to you. Um, so my examples could be, you know, if you're from Princeton Township, you can think about this you know, city. Um, if you're a student, you can think about the university or even maybe a smaller community within the university. You're thinking about you could be thinking about your hometown, etc. So think about that community. And then what I want you to do is, um, in thinking about the people who belong to that community, um, think about who you chose to spend time with in the last couple of weeks, either face to face or online. Okay? And then write down a few pen names of those people. Okay? So if you, if you could just take like a minute or two to brainstorm who in that community have you been actively choosing to spend time with, and that could be online, not face to face. All right. So. Um, let me first tell you what I mean as a, as a psychologist by a social norm. I'm going to use one of my favorite toy examples. Um, for some of you who are going to do teachings all day and you've noticed how they change from teaching to teaching, how they're structured, or maybe for some of you this is your first time. Um, but when you get into this room, probably one of the questions that's on your mind is, well, when can I ask questions, right? What's the expectation for me? What's going to be, you know, considered normal or desirable in this room? Um, your perception of when you can ask questions is um, an example and a good example of a social norm, right? So um, over the course of this teaching, um, you know, I already made some statements at the beginning saying, you know, I, I like a lot of interaction, please ask questions. Um, but I'm not the only one in charge of this social norm. Um, you as a group of people are going to um, organically establish that norm as we go. So if you do actually ask questions, then uh, the rest of you are going to observe this and, and think to yourselves, like, okay, like this is normative, this is desirable, this is typical in this group, or we're an active group, right? Um, on the other hand, even if I did encourage you to ask questions, but um, you know, when someone did answer a question, maybe I dismiss it, or maybe other people, you know, sort of look at that person with an impatience or annoyance, that would be a way to you know guide the norm in a different way, right? And it would discourage norms, people would start to think, you know, it's not so desirable, kind of just ask what's what's on your mind. Um, so, so this is a great idea of what I mean um, by, by a social norm. Um, what I'd like to argue as a, as a psychologist, as a, as a researcher, is that for some social norms are so important for our behavior in many, many situations um, that they can even guide decisions not about whether you ask questions during teach-ins, but whether or not you participate in violence. Okay, And I'm going to make the distinction um, between two important um, concepts. One is the uh, one concept is your personal belief. So you've all come to this teaching with different beliefs about the importance of asking questions, right? So maybe some of you think, well, for me, I like to remain quiet and take it in, ask questions at the end. Other people want to intervene right away. You all have different personal preferences, but you can all converge on a shared perception. We're all building that, you know, within this group. Um, and my argument here is that social norms are so important because they can often overrule what you personally want to do. You're going to kind of go along with the group, especially a group that's important to you. Right? So, um, so just to make that really clear, um, the way I would define a social norm is a perception of what is currently, or maybe increasingly, um, typical or desirable in your community. And so right now, this is our community, but we have lots of different communities we belong to. 
Um, so an example of a norm perception would be most Americans support same-sex marriage, right? And we can distinguish that from a personal attitude, which is I support same-sex marriage. Those can be in harmony with each other, but they can also be in conflict with each other. And I'm really interested in the cases in which they're in conflict with one another, and I've done a lot of research on that. Um, so one reason I've told you why I think norms are important is that they guide behavior. Um, another way to define a social norm is that they're like the social laws of a group. Um, you're not going to be thrown in prison for violating a social norm, um, but what might happen to you is that you are ostracized. Um, people may think you're odd, um, or even worse, that you're that you're wrong, right? And um, this kind of social ostracization really drives a lot of our behavior. Okay, so um, let me give you. So I told you I have three studies that I'm gonna to use to talk about um, the importance of social norms and what changes them, and, and how we can maybe capitalize on what we know to try to change people's behavior. Here's the first case. So it's um, the Supreme Court case of Obergefell uh, v. Hodges. This was the Supreme Court case um, where they announced on June 26th that they were legalizing same-sex marriage in the United States, right? Um, a graduate student and I were very interested in whether institutions, very well-recognized and, and legitimate institutions in our communities can change our perceptions of actually what is normative, that's what, that what is typical or desirable. So what we did um, was we tracked um, people's perceptions. So this is a big sample of um, American uh, citizens. They all identified themselves as American citizens. Um, and uh, we asked them, starting in March of 2015, to what extent do Americans oppose or support same-sex marriage? So again, this isn't asking about your personal opinion, it's asking about everyone else. And um, you can see that when this black line uh, marks uh, the 26th of, of June, 2015, that was a Supreme Court decision announcement. You see that it jumps. Okay, It might not look big to you, but for a social scientist, we think of that as a pretty big jump. Okay. Um, the same thing for when we ask them, to what extent will support for same-sex marriage increase or decrease in the future? Again, we see this bump after the Supreme Court decision. And what's really interesting is that you can contrast this to their personal attitude. So here we were just asking them, do you support same-sex marriage? The, the court has no effect on their personal beliefs. Okay? Um, and here's something that we might all be interested in, especially right now. We can split that out to look at conservatives and liberals. And um, maybe one thing that's comforting at this point is that we actually observe this uh, change in perception of the social norm among both conservatives and liberals. They're both watching the court, and they're taking it as the signal that something's changing in the United States, right? Um, there's, there's more support uh, for same-sex marriage, okay? So that's one case. I just want to show you an example, data that we have on, uh, I think, the bottom line here. Institutions are important, especially institutions they're highly respected. And in the United States, um, especially given the unpopularity of Congress and other types of institutions that we have and share nationally, Supreme Court is one of those big ones. Okay. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, sure. This so, one right here? Yeah. But there are fewer data points for conservatives. Is that just because you sampled fewer or people didn't want to answer that question to start with? So is there a self-selection? There were fewer conservatives in our sample. Okay. Um, yeah, that's why. Yeah. Anybody else have a question about yeah. anything I said? Yeah. So, this is something I've been wondering about. But how often do policy decisions track social norms versus the other other way around? Because even though <coughs> there seems to be a spike before the 26th of June. Right? Um. So a spike. Or um, an increase. An increase. Um. That's not what we yeah. observe. I'm not. Um. So, but 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 you're question is really important, so, so let me get to that. And there's been a lot of um, uh, interest in understanding how the Supreme Court maybe sometimes get a, gets ahead of public opinion or um, is uh, part of the momentum of public opinion. So as you probably all know, there's been a lot of momentum toward a greater acceptance of same-sex marriage in the United States. You can contrast that with a decision like Roe v. Wade. Um, when Roe v. Wade was announced, Americans were split about 50-50. And that had grown, that support had grown. But uh, what a lot of analysts have proposed is that Roe v. Wade was actually a little bit ahead of its time. And what that uh, resulted in was a plateauing. We're locked in to this day in this country of 50-50 pro uh, and anti the Roe v. Wade decision. Um, and uh, so the two arguments are it came ahead of its time and so it wasn't really tracking very well uh, the, the, the public opinion. 
And two, that since it was at 50-50, that allowed for a lot of um, organizations to rush in and start activism, and that this um, uh, anti-abortion activism is one reason why the momentum of steady, steady, steady increase in um, uh, support um, maybe was slowed down. So that's what some people have talked about with respect to that. Um, yeah. There are other court cases like uh, Loving um, that you know we've been talking about a lot lately where the momentum was very strong up to that, uh, up to that point, and so we don't have to do the same thing. Did you want to follow up on that? Yeah. No, would you consider Roe v. Wade an exception, or is that pretty? Is that a pretty vanity observed one? Um, I think that it uh, is definitely maybe the the prototype, and and uh, Supreme Court scholars have identified other cases like that one. Um, I'm not a Supreme Court scholar, so I can't go into the detail. But I don't think that people have thought of it as uh, you know a huge outlier, so different from from other uh, cases. Any other questions? Okay, so let me tell you about another example of social norms, um, and one that's close to my heart because this is uh, one that I studied in my dissertation. Um, I went to Rwanda as a graduate student to study the impact of um, a radio soap opera um, in Rwanda, and it was 10 years after the genocide. And the reason that, um, uh, that I wanted to study this soap opera is because it was what's, it was part of a genre of radio soap operas um, found in many developing countries, but even here in the United States, where they're using entertainment as a way uh, to get across some educational messages. Um, in this case, um, this particular um, group, La Benevolencia, was trying to get across messages about ethnic reconciliation. So this was 10 years after um, an ethnic genocide in which um, there was mass participation, um, neighbors were coming back together after you know um, some members of some household had killed members of the other household. And the idea was how, how can we all live together? Um, so they had many very direct educational messages in this program. So the characters, um, it was following kind of a Romeo and Juliet love story. Um, uh, fortunately, instead of falling to their death, Romeo and Juliet um, join together and start a youth peace movement. So there's lots of, sort of very direct you know, messages about how you can foment positive change and, and resist violent messages of authority. Um, and so I was doing a study to understand, you know, um, what was the impact of, of this radio show. And what we found that was really interesting to me. So recall that the people who are listening to this radio program had just lived through this genocide. And what they responded to us in the outcome surveys um, were things like the following. Um, I don't believe you that uh, intermarriage between ethnic groups will bleed peace. I have seen um, Hutu husbands kill their Tutsi wives. So I don't believe you that this is, you know, the case. But nonetheless, you know, I agree with the radio show and with all of my peers that now we're getting back together. We should allow our children to marry whomever they want. So there was this um, normative lesson that they were taking away from the show that as Rwandans, we now believe in intermarriage again. We should be doing this, even if we don't personally necessarily buy the message that it will prevent violence. So. Um, it was a very interesting case of this dissimilarity between um, personal attitudes and, and perceived norms. Um, and in this case, we found that that was really important because we also found behavioral change. So when we went into the communities where they had been listening to this reconciliation radio show, as opposed to another radio show that was also a soap opera, very entertaining, but it had health messages, we compared these, these communities in the communities where they'd been listening to this reconciliation program um, we gave them a common resource, we watched how they shared it, we found that there was more sharing um, and that there was also more discussion and dissent about how they could do this um, a little bit more uh, together as a community and so forth. So we thought that this mattered and these norms mattered because it made a difference for behavior, not just how they talked about these issues. Um, what's really interesting about this case is that it fits with uh, these accounts that we've heard of the, the dark side of, of media in Rwanda. So some of you um, may know that um, in the Rwandan case, one reason why we focused on radio was because radio was a big part of the genocide. There were hate radio stations uh, going up to um, uh, 1994 that, first of all, were very entertaining. They had lots of pop music, lots of jokes. Um, young people were really attracted to listen to this, even Tutsi young people. Um, 
who uh, were the butt of so many of the um, ethnic uh, jokes and, and stereotypes <laughs> that were featured in this hateful radio program. Um, this radio program went on to broadcast uh, death lists during the genocide to encourage people to do their work, which was the euphemism for going out and killing, um, and to join roadblocks and even directing people within the capital toward where they could go to, to help out with this effort. Um, but what we've learned from some economists is that in places where more people had access to this radio program, that is, they were aware that other people were listening to this radio program, that's when you see participation in this collective violence go up. So that's what this graph is, is telling you. Um, there's a little bit more information in there. Um, I won't go into it unless you want me to, but basically, going up, um, this vertical direction means more of the population participating in the violence. And as you move out this way, it means more of the people who have access to this radio program. So in some ways, you can also understand this as a, as a kind of perception of a social norm. I know that, you, that you're also listening to it. You know that I'm also listening to it. We're all hearing this invocation to join the violence. And we find that when we're all listening to it together, um, that, that that's when we join collectively um, to, to um, participate in the violence. OK. So, so just to review, what am I saying? Where do people get their ideas about social norms? I'm saying they get it from mass media. They get it from institutions, at least legitimate ones, that we respect. Um, but the other place they get it from is salient community members. And so that's where I want to turn back to the lists that you made at the beginning of, of this um, teaching. Um, so for those of you who joined late, I asked people to think about communities to, to which they belong and write down uh, up to 10 people who they chose to spend time with in the last couple of weeks, either face-to-face -face or online. Um, I've been doing a lot of research on how, um, uh, from the ground up, right, so mass media and, you know, the Supreme Court are difficult for us all to affect um, as individuals. Collectively, we can get together to try to do this, but I'm very interested also in, in what we can do as, as individuals. And so I've focused on these salient community members. Let me tell you what I, what I mean by that. Um, so, so in a community, and I've been doing a lot of studies with my uh, research group um, in uh, um, U.S. high schools and middle schools, so I'll use that as our example, but um, I want you to try to think about it more broadly. Um, we're all looking around, and as I used the example in the beginning, we're trying to figure out like what's normal to do here. Like, How can I fit in, or at the very least, how can I not stand out too much? Um, we're, lo we're looking to try to, to, to gauge what's the social norm. When we look around to do this, we're not all looking at the same people, and we don't have enough um, bandwidth to really know what everybody's doing and kind of take like the average of whatever that is, right? So we're all embedded in these social networks. Um, we pay attention to some people more than others. Um, and so some people might be paying attention to multiple people, but at least one of those people is a really salient person, okay? Mm -hmm. So we're interested in what happens when these people speak out on an issue or change their behavior toward an issue. Um, is that a more effective way of spreading a new social norm as opposed to just trying to get everybody to do something, which is harder? Um, and so we're trying to think about how to better use the science of social networks and our, and our lay understandings of social networks to try to spread uh, social norms in a more efficient way, a more rapid way, maybe a more powerful way. Um, in particular because in, in communities where everybody knows each other and, and maybe there's a lot of um, reputational status, um, success, you know, involved, um, we think that, you know, there may even be backlash effects when we try to get everybody to do something. You can almost think of it like fashion. Um, you know, when, when some people adopt a certain fashion, maybe others say, look, I don't want to be like them. You know, my identity is different. And they may try to distance themselves. So, there are lots of factors to trying to spread a message, and, and we're trying to understand how to do it well. Um, so what we've been doing is we've been going in and mapping the social network of high schools and middle schools by asking the question that I asked you in the beginning. So basically, all the students sit down at the beginning of the day and simultaneously take this survey, and they write down who in their school they chose to spend time with over the last couple of weeks. When we map out these data, this is what it looks like. Um, so each circle here is a, is a student. Um, and the, the students who are colored yellow are uh, students who we call social reference. These are just, this is just our jargon academic term for a salient community member. These are the people who are getting a lot of attention. So if I zoomed in on that graph, it looked like you know, the, the two young women were at the center of each type of graph. So 
Um, they can be different too. Some of them, we call them the widely knowns. Um, and we call them that very purposefully. Uh, we don't call them popular. Um, because if you think about your communities, the people who are the most salient aren't always the most well-liked. But nonetheless, they're getting lots of attention. And so much attention that, that not everybody in their network is actually even related to one another, right? Um, but then you have the click leaders. These are smaller groupings of people. Everybody knows each other, right? So, okay, so we're clear on that. So what we do is we go into these networks and, and we um, find out who are the social reference. And then our intervention strategy has been what, do, what happens when we activate these people? Um, and we've been working on uh, the issue of conflict in schools. So whether that's sexual harassment or racial slurs or racial jokes, um, uh, you know, class-based uh, stigmas and so forth, and we paint it with a really broad brush. Some people call you know, some of it bullying, but there's so many different types of behaviors that you could include in sort of peer conflict and harassment. Um, that's what we're trying to change. Um, norms about whether, for example, um, it's normal when students start drama. So we did a lot of work in each school to figure out what terms they used. Uh, so it's definitely not bullying. We were informed of that you know, right off the bat. Like kindergartners bully. In our school, it's drama. So we use drama in, in our questions. And we would ask people, you know, well, how widespread is this? How normal do people think it is? Um, because we know that for a lot of students, it's not that they personally always believe the messages or, or in the um, stereotypes that they're propagating, um, but they recognize it as a very socially sanctioned way to defend your reputation or <coughs> your social status. Um, what I'm arguing is, is kind of provocative, and so you should feel free to push back on me if you like. Maybe another way to put it is what I'm arguing is that if you observe a lot of, for example, racial discrimination at a school, it may be the case that it's not because you have a lot of racist kids Right? You may have some racist kids and some who haven't thought it through enough. But what you definitely have is a norm that tells them that it's normal and it's okay to use these kinds of terms and to use these kinds of jokes. Right? Um, and so in some ways it's a little bit of an optimistic hypothesis. It says if we can try to get this to be less normative, you know, people will look and behave less racist. Right? Um, and, it, and it's not to say that you're just hol you know, holding back and repressing you know, racism exists among everybody. It's that some people are truly on the fence, right? Um, and uh, and they can actually you know, be changed by these perceptions. Yeah. How important is it for a kid? I have teenagers in high school. Yeah. How important is it for um, the kids to know how they fit into that network? Right. Like right. To know whether they're the Cuban leader or whether they're, a, you know, a yeah. disconnected peripheral participant or yeah. a connected participant. I think that. Um, this may change from community to community. Um, in high schools, I think there's often a lot of awareness of one's status. Um, so the first time we ever did this in one high school, um, we got together all of the social reference who we had chosen. And I think that what was so profound about the moment when they all walked into the room the first time is they weren't all friends, but they looked at each other and they were like, how did you find us? You know, they really were like, very surprised. They, we hadn't told them that this was precisely what we were doing with the survey. But they recognize every one of them as like high status people, salient people. And um, I think another interesting thing about that was that, um, you know, we of course were in constant contact with the school principal and, you know, we got parental permission and all of that. They knew what we were doing as an anti conflict, anti harassment program. Um, but they were very shocked at some of the students who we invited in because um, our method was a very neutral method. We didn't ask, like, which kids are not involved in, you know, which 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 kids are which young people are paradigms of good behavior, right? So, when the parents and the principals and even some students found out who was part of this anti-conflict group, they were a little bit shocked. They said, "But this person is at the center of some of this." Mm -hmm. said, yeah, we know, <laughs> and that's important and you, too. And you grab you identified that based on their social media presence. Or? No, this was all from that survey that we did at the beginning when we asked them, "Who did you choose to spend time with over the last couple of weeks?" So the way we constructed the survey, the survey question, the one that I posed to you at the beginning, I'm sorry you came a little late, so I didn't get to tell you that question. Um, the way we composed that sur the question was, we were trying to get some form of behavior, so not just who do you think of as your friend, and you know, everybody's definition of a friend changes, but a behavioral measure 
to try to get at attention. What we're really interested in is who, is who gets attention in their communities, right? So if a lot of people are choosing to spend time with you, with you they're, ch they're choosing to pay attention to you in a very like active <coughs> way. So that's why we, that's how we uh, drew the network and, and found them. Um, yeah, yeah. I was wondering, did you find that this intervention changed the salience of the salient community members? Um, what we were most afraid of in our intervention was whether it would um, decrease their status, <laughs> um, and it didn't. Um, and on average, in this study, we found that um, uh, when we picked them as part of the program, we didn't pick all of the social reference, so we had a pool of social reference who we could compare them to. Um, we found that the ones who we picked gained one social network tie over the course of the year, so they, they went up a little bit in terms of how many connections they have. But that seems reasonable because we put them in this group, they probably made friends with one another in this group. So it was sort of like a status neutral intervention. But I could certainly imagine, um, you know, ways of trying to push these students to do things that, first of all, they would not want to do, but maybe also would decrease their status. So that's a really good point and one that I want to um, call your attention to um, because doing interventions with the community and, and, and trying to activate these social reference, you have to be really careful to allow them to send a public public message to their peers in a way that they find acceptable and that won't, you know, sort of endanger that status that they have. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, yeah. Do you think the fact that, you know, they, they gained another connection, that that's maybe a connection with another leader of groups so of kind of like two groups came together. Right. Right. Is that a meaningful yeah, that part of, of really propagating this and becoming, making it a new norm? Yeah, it absolutely could be. Um, I think that's a really good point. Um, so there's there's competing tensions when um, you get this group together and try to spread a new message. One is you probably like them to unite and you know say to the community like we are all united in our you know opposition to conflict. The thing that we always worry about is you go back to this social network map. Um, the truth of it is, the way this map works, I could make this into lots of different shapes, so it's a little bit of a meaningless map. But the, the point I want to make with it is that um, uh, these students come from all different parts of the network. And so in some parts of the network, some of these like smaller clips where they're the leader of a clip, um, they would maybe find it like against their identity to be joining up with leaders of another clique, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the thing that you that we we've tried to be sensitive to is that if you want sort of cultural change, climate change, to change the norm of this whole community, you have to try to pick some pick people from different places in the network and um, and allow them to maintain their own you know subgroup identities within the network. So we wouldn't want to also like create a message that you know we are all the same. Right. Just to link that to other things that are happening now, there are all these grassroots organizations, and there, there's a lot of people are saying, well, we're, you know, we're duplicating efforts. Should we all join? Should we not all join? And, and I think, it, I hear what you're saying, I, and I've been feeling that, too, but it's better to not all join, because then people lose their identity and they're not as invested. So even though there's some duplication, the message might actually become more, um, I don't know, yeah. the messages might really, uh, uh, penetrate more when, when each group has its own identity. Yeah, yeah. That's a really interesting parallel. I mean, so in the history of social movements, there's always been struggle within a large umbrella movement for recognition of different subgroups, and that's really important. And so the other thing that's important is coordination. Let's all push toward something that's generally the same. Right. So, so you did that for them. Yeah. Coordinated them, but let them remain their own. That's movies. right. That's right. So, um, so yeah, I think that general message is like just absolutely true. And then how we all navigate that tension in any one specific movement is is complicated, but it's <coughs> minds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we measured lots of different, you know, things in a survey. We asked kids if the end of the year, if it's normal to start drama, if it's weird, you don't defend your friends in a conflict, whether people are seriously affected by harassment. And, and um, we don't have to get into any of the statistics, but the basic message is that it was a pretty hopeful outcome, that we found that these these social reference students were able to change people's ideas about whether at their school, in general, the norms were 
um, about harassment and um, and and conflict that that um, their sense that this was a strong norm decreased over the course of the year. Um, and it mattered for their behavior too. So we collected data, you know, from their teachers. We asked their teachers who uh, defends other people when they get into fights and um, who contributes to a negative environment. Um, so on the plus side and then and the negative side, um, we collected, you know, who was getting sent to the office, you know, for peer conflict. And we found that, you know, um, these uh, positive behaviors <coughs> were spreading through the network from these these social reference. Um, we've done this now with lots of different. Um, uh, middle schools, this is all throughout the state of New Jersey, with lots of different social networks, and we found that this replicated in a, in a separate study. Um, and um, I'll go into this study just a tiny bit, not to, um, to talk about the social science necessarily, but to talk about the, um, the intervention that we designed for them. It's an intervention that's an open source intervention, we've, we've sort of given it away to schools, we called it the Roots Program. And I'm going to go into it just as you know, brainstorming for um, how to address <coughs> social reference. So we decided to design our own intervention. There are lots of anti-conflict interventions out there. Um, what we thought was important was to allow, getting back to this point of allowing different subgroups to speak in their authentic voice to their peer group, um, we designed it as a way um, to invite these young people to work on this issue of uh, conflict at their school, but in their own way. So we had this, what we called the Roots Change Box, where we said, you know, what would you change about your school? So we started with really broad questions, and, you know, definitely some of them said, like, I want a better lunch at the cafeteria. And we say, okay, so then, like, what about social relationships? Like, what would you like to change about those? And, and people um, came up with different areas that they wanted to work on. So um, if my memory serves me well, you know, one of the big ones that they came up with was, um, across many different schools, was, I want people to stop you from being gay as an insult. Um, another big one was, um, I hate the way we all have to sit at, like, very particular tables in the cafeteria and we're, like, not allowed to move around and have different groups of friends and so forth. Um, but it, it varied from school to school, so for us this was really important not to come in with a manual saying, you know, it's, it's like a, you know, just say no kind of manual, but rather, you know, what makes you uncomfortable to come to school? What what makes you feel unwelcome at school? What's the, in an in a environment like that, what's the, uh, the ratio of people that are actually comfortable with the way things are versus those that are actually, that, that conservatives versus the liberals? That's really interesting. Um, <coughs> Is it everybody that will be, even though you have a lot of uh, suggestions as to which of the things, right. are right. the right. students that are just more comfortable? Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. Um, I don't know the exact ratio. Um, I would just say that you're pointing to an excellent um, issue, which is that especially some of these people who are more high status in their in their networks might um, take issue with different things than, than others, right? And they may actually love the status quo. <laughs> um, uh, but what was interesting, at least in this context, so you could always... I'm not saying that this is the question to ask right. anyone, right? Um, we developed this question because what we found um, was not that all stu that some of these high status students just felt like things were great. We found that they had tons of status struggles. Um, so they achieved their high status in part through lots of conflict, and that the tools of conflict that they were using, a lot of them, they actually you know found them to be really unpleasant. Um, so the cycles of, of conflict, of you know, group on group conflict, they mentioned that a lot. That um, you always have to, you know, be watching out for your friends and speak up for them. So we actually didn't have trouble getting them to talk about things they didn't like. Um, for us, where we had to, you know, be very um, open and patient and go with them where they wanted to go, was that sometimes they would mention things that, you know, I think as an adult studying conflict, I'd say, well. Maybe in the grand scheme of things, that isn't so important. I wish you would work on this instead. Um, but I think if we had forced them into that, that would have diminished their um, authentic enthusiasm about participation. And we felt that they wouldn't actually follow through, that, that none of their peers who were paying attention to, to them in the network would actually think that they were authentically invested in the message. So there were common themes across the hierarchy? You know, they, no, they really varied a lot. And these okay. schools varied a lot. So how many of you are from New Jersey or spent lots of time in New Jersey? 
New Jersey is such an interesting ecosystem. It's a very heterogeneous population. There are people on the shore and you know, in more urban areas and very rural areas. And we found that the, the issues really were very different So across schools. So we had um, 60 schools in this study. 60? Yeah. Wow. Just wondering about the applications of this course of inquiry into corporate America, which is often compared to high school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we all think we're really far away from high school in our communities, but we find similar patterns. Um, yeah, well, I would love to hear from you what you think. I mean, so, you know, as a social scientist, I haven't done the study in corporate America, but I think and hope that a lot of these principles of identifying people who get a lot of attention in their social networks and trying to work with them on messages about what they want to take a stand on and make people feel less acceptable or more acceptable, I hope would have a more general, that's why we did this. Um, we're not developmental psychologists. We didn't actually study this in particular. Uh, we did this because it was a nice bounded social network where we could go into one place, measure the entire network, and try to see whether those dynamics could play out. Yeah. I guess another point is that a lot of people, when I present this work, will say, but as adolescents, we care so much about our peers. You know, like, fortunately, we're over that now. I mean, that's like exaggerating their point, right? But, um, uh, but it's to say that, you know, we still very, care very much about social norms, I think, so. Um, and that's like foundation of marketing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, and again, just to get back to something um, I was saying in the very beginning, it appears that our government has been running on social norms <laughs> for much of what we took to be, you know, um, required by law was actually, no, this is just normative uh, behavior. Um, and we, as we just assume that people will constrained uh, by the desire to be seen as a normal, typical, desirable candidate of that of that ilk. And then where you showed at the start of your talk something about uh, attitudes towards people's attitudes towards yeah. same-sex ma marriage right. after the Supreme Court decision. Isn't an analog of this is the spike in hate crimes after the election? And is there research being done on that? So, um, to make sure I understand, wouldn't an analog be that um, before the election we thought, well, hate crime is relatively rare, and now we think hate crime is actually pretty widespread. It's not as big of a deal to, to you know, have hate crime here. Lots of people are doing. What I had in mind was more along the lines of hate crime is very socially undesirable. Right. Whereas yes. after the election seems to have made some people yeah. think that it is not that undesirable after all. That's right. So I haven't done this research, but my reading of the hate crime research is that a big predictor of hate crime acts is the perpetrator's perception that their community supports them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that's a really big deal. Mm -hmm. um, the, the idea that at least for your local community that um, there is support for, or even at least people not speaking out against it um, as, a, as a big motivator of the actual act. Um, this is something we should be really concerned about, absolutely. Yeah. I, I have a question, but it's from about something a little earlier on. I don't, sure. I don't want to derail if you're going for So uh, it was about the results that you showed us for the intervention. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you, so you showed us, if I understood correctly, you were showing that that the closer somebody was, or the more connection somebody was, somebody had to the um, the person uh, in the network that you actually intervened on, the more of an effect there was on that person's behavior and their percent and their their own sort of self-expressed norms in exactly. the future. Exactly. Um, did you also? I, I guess I'm wondering. There's sort of another there's another question which is more a holistic question of if you're going to intervene on a certain number of people. Is the intervention more effective if you target those people who are in the high connectivity positions? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I, I, I didn't understand whether you actually addressed that in what you were showing. Yeah, before. so that's actually what we were addressing in the 60 school study. Because in our first study, we only had one school. So we couldn't tell whether at the end of the year, the amount of conflict we observed at the school was due to our project, because we had some people who we intervened with and some people who we didn't. In this um, 
uh, study, it's exactly, you're leading me to precisely the point, which is that we did the, the intervention in some schools and not at all in others. And so we could actually test how much overall conflict is there at the school at the end of the year after you've used this intervention. Do you also have a version where you're like intervening on like just random people rather than uh, yeah. the same? Okay, great. I love this. I, I okay. need to keep right. all right. my talks, um, <laughs> uh, like my academic talks. Um, yeah, so just to, I'll just take you through the logic of the rest of the intervention and then I'll show you those results. Because actually, oh, th that's the bottom line and we don't need to draw it out. Basically, what we found, um, which I was really open to finding either way, I mean, it would be, Nice if anybody could do this, but it turns out that these high, highly connected people are better. So in some of the schools, um, we, we just had a random assortment of young people in this second study, and so some of them were the highly connected social reference and some of them were not. Um, and we can trace their influence individually through, through the network using our social network strategies. We find that the highly connected people are better at changing other people's perceptions of the norm. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, so that's the bottom line of this study. I'll show you a, one figure. I'll limit myself to that. But I just wanted to show you other stuff that we did. Basically, what, if I could describe it in a very um, uh, intuitive way, we collected this group of students together in this intervention we designed, and we basically acted like their campaign managers, right? So we, you know, asked them first, like, what do you care about? What's your platform going to be? And then we tried to just make their position on that issue very public. The idea was, you know, if these are the people who are getting more attention than others, then let's just make sure that their behavior, that their position on this issue is really observable to others. So, um, you know, they could teach us a lot about social media, but um, at the same time, we tried to follow them there, help them with Instagram campaigns. Since this was middle school and not everybody was on social media yet, we also had them uh, do, you know, in-person hashtag uh, campaigns, so they made posters. And you can see that they were signing them. This was one way we tried to make it really salient that, you know, it's me who's behind this message, right? And so that was the logic behind every activity that we did with them, is try to, like, um, you know, just raise up the salience of what they were taking a stand about. Um, we went and tried to find out, like, what's popular, you know, for uh, young people in these schools. I can't explain it, but these Lance Armstrong rubber wristbands are, like, perennially popular. And so we allowed them to design their own with uh, messages, you know, like, chill out, pay it forward, include, calm down. There's a lot of, like, please calm down messages. <laughs> um, and, um, and we did stuff like they would hand out these wristbands to other people to try to raise awareness of what in particular they thought was an important message. We even had a special orange wristband, orange because we were coming from Princeton, that's where it was also a very like, you know, noticeable color, um, which they gave to other students when they felt like they had done something that they really loved. So if you had my son's kindergarten. That's awesome, yeah, but, but usually it comes from teachers. So does it come from teachers? Yeah. So the idea here was like, this has to come from students. Students are the ones that govern so much of what they feel is acceptable behavior. And, you know, for some students in a school, being praised by a teacher is almost, you know, a perverse incentive that yeah. now, you know, you're being seen in a different way by your peers. Um, so this is the figure that I was talking about. So this is the proportion of social reference who were in that anti-conflict group. As you got more and more of these highly connected people, the, the rate of conflict at the school went down mm -hmm. overall. And so that's up to a 20% decrease in, and this data is um, the number of times you were punished in the office for a peer conflict. So, it's, you know, it's like an official administrative record, not what the students were telling us about their, their conflicts. Okay, so, um, yeah. yeah is that if there was identity preservation through the study, right. did the conflict decrease because more students just accepted the identity of the influencers? Or did the conflict decrease because students were able to preserve their identity and were able to make peace with those that have different opinions? That's a great question. Um, I didn't, you know, we, as a research team, we didn't set up the experiment to try to address that specific question. I think that's a really, um, important assumption that we were working with though. Like our assumptions were all about allow them to maintain their identities, do not force them into a particular um, identity. For example, a representative of your school. You know, be just a representative of your group. Just work on the stuff that you care about. We never tried to force them into other social networks. We never said, you know, go to these people and, and confront. 
this is actually a really good space to tell you about other research that's coming out right now. First of all, and, and, and this research is generally about um, confrontation um, among peers, um, adults, uh, when uh, you hear something that's um, discriminatory or racist or sexist or you know, class, lots of different confrontations. Um, the research set says has two important lessons that I could boil down um, that are emerging. One is that um, it's a very stressful thing to do to confront someone who's, who's saying something that you find objectionable or discriminatory. Um, two, that it is most stressful for a person who is being targeted by that discrimination to address someone in a more powerful position um, and that they are less um, effective when they do that. Their, their protestations are seen, are dismissed uh, as too sensitive um, and as biased. Uh, and so the people who are effective at confrontation are people from the same either racial or gender or class group. Um, so it's this vertical, uh, it's, excuse me, this, it's this horizontal confrontation that is most effective. And so um, that may make a lot of intuitive sense to you, but we didn't have these data um, as well as, as we do now as we did before. Um, an example of this uh, study that I really like was uh, one that someone did recently on Twitter. It's a um, guy named Kevin Munger. It sounds like some of you have heard this. He basically programmed a bunch of Twitter bots. Mm -hmm. And these bots went out and found anyone uh, uh, who was a young man, identified as a young man, on uh, Twitter who was using the N-word. White young men. Okay? Um, the Twitter bots were either identified as a young man of color with lots of followers or with few followers, and a young white man with lots of followers or few followers. Um, the Twitter bots would essentially um, respond with an automated script to people using the N-word saying, Something I can't re recall the exact script, but like. This is not cool. Do you want to? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I like this. This is now a team teaching. Um, and so, do you want to say the results? What were the most um, effective people? I'm not entirely sure, but I feel like the the white males with tons of followers had the largest impact, whereas uh, black male bots with few followers had no impact whatsoever. Maybe some even some negative impact. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, and remember, it's it's white, you know, bots speaking to white young men, right? Um, the the racial divide was the the strongest one, um, but then it, they also had to be high status too, and they were effective, measured as the number of times that these actual young men on Twitter used the N word again. Mm -hmm. These are really important results because it also, you know, speaks to I think some of these findings, which suggest like work within your own sub communities, address people from your own group, and it's not to say we cannot, you know, cross communities, but we do know something about some effective communication, and uh, communication in particular around what's cool and what's not cool. I mean, another reason why I loved this study that, that um, you're helping me to, to, to talk about now is that um, it was a very normative message they used, right? So saying something's not cool um, could definitely reflect, you know, you could say this isn't cool with me. But, you know, this research would suggest it's more effective to say, no, this is not cool to any of us, right? And, and so that was another reason I love that. So it, I think we have to stop, but, but here's just some bottom lines. Um, first of all, I'm arguing that social norms matter, um, and they matter in the particular way that I'm talking about for all of our assumptions about, you know, um, what's acceptable within our communities. Um, and ha so how can we use this information? I feel as though... As a group, we can come up with many, many more creative ways than we have so far, at least in my research group, so I, I ask that to you. But some conclusions, these are the very general ones that I think we all already thought of, right? But this is to say that this research would support the idea that supporting mass media and lobbying for more just institutions, this matters because you know we think that the media and these institutions are um, very powerfully shaping what we think is normal. But then um, I think maybe a, a slightly more original idea is to try to mobilize these particular social reference and encourage them to speak personally, authentically, you know, maybe they're not as interested in precisely what you want them to do, but try to get them to address the topic so it's coming from a very authentic place and have them speak to their local peer group. Um, you don't need to drag them onto a community-wide stage, but get them to, a, to mobilize their, their folks, you know, the people within their local social network um, as a way to create change. Um, yeah, so I think, I think we're actually perfectly to time. 
and I'll hang out for a couple minutes if anyone wants to talk about anything. Thank you.